Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the, uh, the second uh, session of Nessus. Uh, these are parallel sessions, and in this room, we have innovations in sports applications. So we have three speakers uh, for you over the next 90 minutes. Uh, the first is uh, Dr. Kathy Evans, uh, who got a PhD in biostatistics from Harvard uh, in 2017. And it, uh, she is passionate about the application of causal inference uh, to sports data. So I will say no more and let Kathy take over. I didn't realize I was supposed to have a longer uh, bio. Um, yeah, okay, so this is, this is work that I did with Mike Lopez. Um, Mike works for the NFL. I, uh, as of uh, 28 days ago, work uh, for the Toronto Raptors. Um, so Mike and I, neither of us works in baseball, um, but this is our joint work uh, on a baseball question. Um, so this is the typical disclaimer that the, anything expressed here is mine and Mike's. It does not in any way, shape, or form reflect the views or opinions of the NFL or the Toronto Raptors or the NBA or anything like that. Um, great. So uh, we're talking about bunting in baseball. So there's sort of this question of why would you ever want to bunt? Um, and the general idea of bunting is you want to move a runner or runners over um, in order to increase the probability that your team either scores more runs in an in inning um, or scores at least one more run in an inning, um, which is the sort of thing of like at the end of, end of a game, if you just need one more run to like tie it or to, to break a tie, then maybe that's worth the trade-off of potentially uh, of the sacrifice of the bunt. Um, but generally, bunting has fallen out of favor lately. It's just not done as often in, in today's uh, baseball. Uh, and so the question is, why and is this, like, does this make sense? So the sort of why is, if you look at expected run tables, um, we can just sort of see the differences in the two scenarios that you're looking at. Okay, so the way that you would read this table, which I got from Tom Tango, um, is to sort of compare the similarly colored squares and the idea is that, right, you have a runner on first and zero outs. If a bunt is successful, successful, uh, you move the runner over to second, and now there's one out. And so the idea is you want to compare these two numbers. And the, the idea is that most of these pairs, the scenario that you're moving to is sort of worse. Um, there's a couple of scenarios where maybe it's slightly better, right? So the probability of scoring at least one run um, maybe goes up if you're bunting a runner from second over to third. Uh, but generally, you look at these expected run tables and you say, hey, it's not worth it to bunt. Um, and this was, I think, sort of generally the prevailing uh, idea behind why bunting has gone out of favor. Um, it's just not worth it. Uh, but the problem is that this scenario, this assumes a number of things. Um, the first is that all bunts are created equal. And the second is that Bunts always will lead to, to moving from you know, this state to this state. You will always successfully um, you know, have, the, have the batter get out and the runners will move. Uh, but bunts also cause a lot of errors. Um, so this is a nice graph that Mike made, which is this idea that we can sort of identify where bunts are and the probability of having there be an error goes way up on bunts. And if there's an error, you have a higher probability that in fact, you get a free base. Like you don't, you know, the, the batter doesn't get out. You now have a runner on first and second with no outs. And that's great. Um, you might also uh, accidentally hit into a double play. And so a bunt could in fact be way, way worse. Um, and so the idea is that uh, you can't just look at those expected run tables. Um, so, so how do we sort of incorporate this kinds of information and other information about the bunting scenarios uh, to, to, you know, do this better. Um, so for example, what about the players? What about the quality of the guy on base who's running? What about the quality of the batter? Is he good at bunting? Um, is he good at hitting? Should he just be hitting? If he's bad at bunting and good at hitting, why would you ever have him bunt? Um, and so we want to sort of control for confounding factors, which are factors that would affect both the decision to bunt and the success of that bunt. So we want to look at the speediness, right? Guys are fast. They're more likely to beat out throws. Um, you want to look at the hitting power of a batter. If he's a very, very good hitter, again, don't waste time bunting. Um, and then also the score, right? Are you in sort of situations uh, where a team might be um, more likely to bunt and I guess maybe having, had a good, having a good game in the pitcher or whatever, right? So we want to control for all of these ideas. And then we're going to be able to get an idea of the effect of the bunt, actually. So maybe get more of a causal effect and then start to try to identify scenarios where it might be optimal to bunt or not. 
Um, I will say, spoiler alert, uh, there's nothing here that I would consider to be um, revelatory. Um, but it, I, think, I think part of the idea of this is to sort of quantify these ideas in a better way. So we're going to look at causal effects using a couple of different methods. We're going to look at inverse weighting. We're going to look at propensity score matching. And we're going to look at BART, which is just the new hotness. Um, and I will say that, uh, to some extent, we're going to fit a bunch of models um, and sort of see what each one says. And, and I'll get into this more as the, as the talk progresses. But there's this idea that, like, you know, in some ways, we do want to carefully stop and think about the exact right way to model the data that we're interested in, right? In statistics, a lot of times we're trying to like understand the true underlying distribution of what we care about. And the problem is that it's really, really hard to ever get that true underlying distribution. And so, you know, a lot of times in my career and in my life, I will have people come up to me and say, hey, I'm thinking about doing this problem in this way or maybe this other way, which do you think? And almost all the time, I say, well, do it both ways and see what happens and see if they agree or they disagree with each other. And so in some ways, by fitting many, many models, we're getting even more of an idea of the uncertainty surrounding the thing that we're trying to estimate, which in this case is the effect of bunting. OK. So we'll start with some of the data. Um, we scraped StatCast data and got every single pitch from 2015 to 2018, those, those uh, three seasons, four seasons. Um, and then got a bunch of player information, and we were able to calculate OPS. Uh, it's sort of unofficial. We calculated it ourselves, and then we truncated it between 0.5 and 1.1, because you occasionally get these OPSs of like 5, which just is kind of unreasonable. Um, got a speed score. Uh, it's missing for 6% of players, so we just dropped them. Um, not ideal, but 6% is, is pretty small, so it's all right. And then looking at a number of, the number of previous bunts. And this is our sort of proxy for bunting ability. Um, there really isn't a statistic for like how good somebody is at bunting. Um, I talked to, to a friend of mine on a team, and he said, well, uh, that, that's probably OK. Maybe you could, he's like, I would probably go and ask my guys how good they are at bunting, and they would probably all say that they're great. Uh, so you can't use that. And then even then, how would you control for the bunting ability of the team you're playing? You can't go and ask them. Um, and then we merged pitch and player information, and we got uh, about 100,000 plate appearances and about 5,600 um, bunts, which is about 5%, which is pretty small, but also intuitively should, should sort of make sense. Um, so again, we have some sample sizes. We're going to look at these specific game situations, right? Uh, no outs, runner on first, no outs, runner on second, no outs, runner on first and second, and then one out, runner on first. And we can look at the, and we're going to split them out because they're kind of different scenarios, and they sort of um, reflect you know, very, very different and we don't want to just pull them together. Um, and we can actually see that the number of times that there actually is bunts um, varies quite a lot, which is that uh, no outs runner on second or no outs runner on first and second, actually about 10% of the time you see a bunt, whereas runner on first no outs, about 7%. And then down here, <laughs> uh, runner on first one out is only about 1% of the time where you actually see a bunt. Um, it was really fun at JSM. We went to a game uh, the day after the, the sports uh, talk. And uh, the Dodgers bunted with a runner on first and one out. It was so exciting. It was a total blowout game. And I was just going crazy. I was, so, I was like, this is amazing, you guys. It never happens. Um, but, uh, but I will say that this should be throwing up positivity flags for any of you causal inference people in the audience. Um, this is a very, very small percentage of the time. And so being able to say things about this is going to be uh, uh, questionable. Um, but, but I think this is, this is part of the idea, is that as we start digging into these questions and we start digging into the actual sample sizes and the actual examples that we have, um, it starts to get sparse very fast. Um, the definitions that we're using is that we're going to look at a bunt on the first pitch, the idea being that like, the decision was made to bunt um, before, you know, a priori. Um, uh, and not, you know, if it was like suddenly the, the guy changed his mind, it, it just gets a little uh, sticky. Um, and then we're going to look at um, any runs scored. So did they score at least one run from that state to the end of the inning? Um, and also the number of runs scored. So we're going to sort of have like a continuous outcome versus a binary outcome. And then we have the, the covariates that I mentioned previously. Um, okay. So the really basic analysis of this is just to split out these situations more carefully and just say, hey, did they score runs? Did they score at least one run? 
um, do this in a way that doesn't just pool everything together, as we saw in the expected run tables uh, at the beginning of the talk. And um, already, right, we can start to see that there's kind of some differences. Um, so the idea is you compare these two together and these two. And I've highlighted in bold the times when bunting seems to be more favorable. And these are different from the previous expected run tables. So already we can see that, like, oh, the estimates change. Um, as we, as, we, as we dig in a little bit deeper. Um, but honestly, the differences are like not that small, right? I mean, this is a difference of like 0 0.02 average runs. Uh, and this is like, you know, again, we have these like very, 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 very small differences um, between bunting and not. OK, so let's get into the actual sort of causal effects part of this. Um, again, there's going to be a number of models. I'm going to try to talk through them in some detail, but we don't have an, an abundance of time, so uh, some of the details will be left to the reader. Um, okay, so the main thing that we're going to do is look at propensity scores. So this is a big thing in causal inference, where instead of looking at just like a treatment or an intervention or a bunt, we're going to look at the probability of having that treatment or intervention or bunt. Um, and so the idea is we want to look at similar at bats in which one had a bunt and one didn't, or groups of similar at-bats where there were bunts and not. Because there's plenty of situations in which a team would just never, ever, ever, ever bunt, and so why include those in any of your models? Um, so the idea is we're going to fit the probability of a bunt given a bunch of features. Uh, and so basically, we're going to look at this sort of game situation, um, the interaction of score and inning, and then obviously just the, the single terms, and then some cubic splines for the rest of the, the covariates. This is sort of our notation that I'm abusing a little bit here. Um, oops. OK. And so the first, the first sort of method that we're going to throw at it is sort of this inverse weighting by odds. So this is going to estimate the effect uh, of the bunt on the at-bats where there was a bunt. So this is a common uh, estimate of interest in causal inference. It's the effective treatment on the treated or the average treatment effect on the treated, um, which is why I have ATT and ETT. It's abbreviated in both ways in the literature, and so I wanted to include both. Um, and the idea is that instead of just weighting by a propensity score, you actually weight by the odds. And then this allows us to compare at-bats where there were bunts to similar looking at-bats where there were no bunts. So this is not an average treatment effect, because an average treatment effect would look at all at-bats where there were no bunts. But again, the idea is that there's plenty of times when a team would just never bunt. And so we don't need to worry about making those comparisons. Um, so this is this equation. Um, I will say that I get a lot of questions about uh, effective treatment on the treated, and you know, how do you learn more? And I highly recommend Mostly Harmless Econometrics. It is my go-to book for um, this kind of stuff. Um, and so we can do this and basically uh, get some results. And I will say that a closed form solution for the variance is often difficult to find in these situations. And so I am a huge fan of just bootstrapping things and just redrawing. And in fact, it's not just a random resample. It's a random resample of every single at bat. But each one is weighted randomly by a 1 over a draw from an exponential distribution with lambda equals 1. And the idea here is, again, we had that positivity flag go up. And the idea is that there's so few bunts that if we just did a random resample in the way that you might normally do a bootstrap, we might end up with a sample that had very, 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 very few bunts. And then weights would start to blow up. But when we do it this way, when we have this weight with a 1 over an exponential, it allows us to incorporate every single at bat and just weight them differently. Um, but the results, I think, also sort of say, hey, maybe don't bunt. Uh, maybe don't bunt. Uh, maybe, maybe here, kind of, maybe think about it. Maybe think about it. But again, right, we're now starting to get a better sense of the variability around what we can expect. Um, and then some sense of, of effect sizes, which actually start to get a little bit bigger over here. Um, uh, but, you know, so we're not really changing our minds about bunts, but we're sort of quantifying it in a, in a better way. Um, so, yeah, again, it still doesn't look like a great idea to bunt. Um, we could be violating, we still could be violating that positivity violations. Again, positivity flags go up. Um, we have to worry about the fact that there just aren't that many bunts, um, especially recently, right? We're taking 2015 to 2018. There's just, you know, bunting has fallen out of favor, so there's even fewer than there would have been in previous seasons. Um, but we also want to take a closer look at propensity scores, right? We're using these a lot, and we want to understand, um, you know, this, this thing that we're, we're going to use a lot. Okay, so the next method is propensity score matching. 
Um, and so the idea is you calculate a propensity score for every at-bat, and then you just literally match them. You literally say, like, hey, this was an at-bat with a bunt. Here's four that didn't have a bunt that looked similar to it. Here's another at-bat that had a bunt. Here's four that looked similar to it. Um, and then we have these great density curves uh, where we can see, like, here was the, the density of, you know, bunts versus no bunts. And then we go through, we create a matched, a, a separate match subset, and now we have way more balance. And in fact, we can now do a bunch of analyses on these matched samples, and we have sort of um, created uh, a population that, that is balanced in the, in the covariates that we care about. Um, and again, by doing this matching, we're estimating the same thing, which is this effective treatment on the treated, the effect of bunting on the at-bats where there were bunts. Uh, and then we can look at each of these four situations again and, and still see that, like, uh, you know, there's not really much to say here. Um, it's actually kind of hard to get standard errors out of this, and um, I, I didn't have time to bootstrap it. So this is just going to be estimates. But again, they're really close to zero, so I can, like, guarantee you that the confidence intervals that we would get out of bootstrapping are just going to contain zero. Um, I, I think of this slide as like the shrug slide, like they're all really close to zero. Okay, positivity flags. We have to like, now, now, now's the time to actually stop and think about this, which is we want to actually look at when are there bunts in the, in the situations that we're thinking about. We are controlling for a lot of covariates. How much are we going to run into sparsity problems? And this is how we're going to get at that, which is to look at the densities of when we actually see at bats. And here we're just going to split it out by two covariates. Uh, well, I guess three, two in each of these. Um, and they're going to come up later when we start thinking about, like, are there scenarios when it makes sense to bunt? And so we're going to look at batter OPS and that batter speed and then batter OPS versus the runner speed just to see, like, hey, you know, there, there are, like, these whole areas where there's just, there just aren't any at-bats, right? You just don't see anything here. And so, in fact, this, the only spaces that you can really say anything are spaces where we actually have observations. I mean, now the idea of modeling, right, is that we borrow information from the observations that we do have so that we can do some sort of extrapolation, right? We do want to borrow some information. And so the idea of like, well, there's, there's nobody here. Can we still say something? Like, yeah, probably, because we have a lot of at-bats close to it. But the further we get away into these big empty spaces, the less it makes sense. Um, and so the final, final method we'll talk about um, is, these, uh, is BART. Bayesian additive regression trees. And BART is, is a really uh, great technique that I have become a convert to. Um, and it's basically, it's a very, very good way of sort of imputing missing data. We have the, you know, if you have something that you don't see, you want to predict some outcome. Um, it takes all the information that you have previously, does things in a really like great way. It's very flexible. It accounts for nonlinearities. It picks up interactions. It's just really, really good at sort of doing predictions. And in causal inference, we're interested in predicting things we don't see. We're interested in predicting counterfactuals. And BART does a very, very good job of predicting, and it does a very good job of predicting counterfactuals. Um, and then what's also great about it is that we're going to be able to like more easily pull out sort of conditional effects. So we saw in that previous graph, we're going to be able to look at these variables and sort of understand the actual effects um, at different levels of OPS and speed. Um, and we're just going to restrict to the binary outcome here because as I continue to do binary and continuous outcomes, uh, the talk got really long and so I had to cut a bunch of stuff. Um, so great. So we can actually start to look at the overall estimate. Right? So we're going to look at each situation separately, and we have sort of an estimate and an interval. And then we can actually start splitting some interesting stuff out, which is like, hey, if we look at the average speed of the runner, um, what happens to the estimate as that speed changes? Um, and the idea is that, like, oh, hey, as the average runner speed goes up, maybe now it, it makes more sense to bunt. Um, but honestly, most of the plots sort of tell the same story, which is like, yeah, it's kind of maybe a little bit negative or maybe a little bit positive, but the intervals are pretty wide and definitely cover zero. Um, and we can do this for each of the scenarios. And there are certainly things that pop out, right? Like all of a sudden here now, the average runner speed, as it goes up, the, the, you know, the effect of bunting goes down. Um, and that seems kind of maybe counterintuitive. Um, but again, as we look at each of these plots, it's still just a lot of like kind of really close to zero, maybe a little bit negative. And, uh, you know, a, a bit of a shrug, which is that we're, we're definitely containing zero in our intervals. 
Um, again, kind of same story. Um, maybe with one out runner on first, the number of bunts that the batter has had uh, is a proxy for how good they are. But right again, this was a really, really, really small sample size. So you could have a couple of successful bunts by somebody who bunts a lot, and it's really, really driving these results. Um, and so we can sort of start doing two-level plots, and we can look at an OPS versus the, the bat speed of the batter. And uh, we've highlighted a couple of guys. Um, and you, know, you can sort of maybe start to see places where it might make sense to bunt. Like apparently this OPS of 28 is a nice band of, of good for bunting. Um, but as soon as that OPS, uh, or sorry, batter speed, sorry, of 28, um, as soon as it gets really high, then, then don't bunt. Um, we can also do the same thing with OPS versus runner speed. And I will say that this is, this is the one, these are the plots where we actually start to get this little shaded area, and that's where it was actually significant. So maybe that starts um, giving us some idea that like, as the runner speed is very, very high and the OPS of the batter is low, then it kind of might make sense to bunt um, because you'd rather have a low OPS batter bunting rather than hitting. Um, but again, right, positivity flag, which is like, this is just straight up the probability of bunting by OPS and runner speed. And, you know, like, there's just so rarely ever, ever, ever going to be a bunt. And so in some ways, I want to be able to take, like, this plot and this plot and, like, these previous ones and just overlay them all on top of each other just to sort of give the idea that it gets really complicated the more you think about, like, where are there at-bats at all, let alone bunting at-bats? Where are there at-bats where there actually was a bunt? And once you have that bunt and you have all of these covariates that you're trying to explain for, you're trying to control for, it just starts getting sparse really, really fast. Um, and so this, you know, this is sort of the concluding thoughts, which is that this, like many problems in sports statistics, are difficult to look at. And um, we have years of data and a lot of bunts. But as soon as we start to parse by even just a few factors, we just don't have a really big comparison group. It just starts to get really hard to, to, to say anything conclusive. Um, and even still, like, we're definitely not controlling for enough features. I think the first time I, I gave this talk, somebody came up and said, like, yeah, what about the infield shift? And I was like, oh, god, that's a really good point. We should probably control for the infield shift. And that's going to add a whole other layer. And then you can think, like, well, just take previous years of baseball data, but the way that bunting has been done has evolved recently. And so yeah, how much can we include, you know, data on bunts from like the early 90s or something and have that uh, inform you know, the way people are bunting in 2019. And I'm sure you can to some extent, but it requires a certain amount of careful thought. Um, and so I think, I think generally you know, this idea is it's really hard. And I, I really like to throw a lot of, of methods at a given problem. Uh, I guess that makes me a data scientist, not a statistician. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I do think that in some ways, right, we're sort of trying to look at uh, variability. We're trying to understand, you know, some sense of where we believe in an outcome. And I like the idea of actually sort of layering different models on top of each other, not explicitly, but in our minds to say, like, well, basically most of the models that I fit either said, like, I don't know, kind of, maybe don't, maybe do it sometimes. <laughs> like, maybe if the guys are really fast and the hitter's not very good, and you just need one run. Um, uh, but some of the other models also said maybe it's not so good, and so I can sort of update in my head this sort of meta-analysis of all of the models that I've looked at to kind of trend towards, like, yeah, bunting's maybe not that great, but like, it's probably not as bad as we originally thought. Um, anyway, that is about my time. Um, Mike and I are both very active on Twitter. I'm less active these days now that I work for a team. Um, but I'm always, we're always happy to talk about this kind of stuff. Uh, just don't ask me about Pascal Siakam. So that's all. Thank you. Uh, so time for a question or two if I don't have one. Oh, yeah, we did not include pitchers. Pitchers were totally scraped from the data. Yes. Yes. Yeah, but there was no bunting pitchers. Yeah. Partially because there was no, like, there was definitely no speed score available for them, and also because they're just a whole separate category in themselves.
about where you are in the lineup? Who comes in? Who's up to bat after the bunter? Yeah, that's a good question, and um, we thought about including it and just didn't, but I think that's, an, that's another clear other thing to add would be who's the next guy. Yeah. Any more questions? Just yell. I'll repeat it. Uh, for a Bart convert, evangelize. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I am a BART convert, partially because uh, my two collaborators that I worked with this year really like BART, and I didn't have a lot of choice. Um, but also, it, it, it does well, and it um, basically, especially when thinking about covariate balancing and stuff like this, you have to, when you're doing propensity score matching or looking at propensity scores, which is something that I did for a really long time, you have to worry about covariate balance. You have to make sure that you're doing all this sort of stuff, and it's in a very ad hoc nature. Um, and I like BART because it doesn't have to worry about a lot of that. Um, I like that it's very flexible. It accounts for all these nonlinearities. So you don't have to do a lot of the feature engineering ahead of time. Um, I do worry that it's a little bit of a black box, um, that you just shove stuff in and you get a prediction out and isn't that great. Uh, but in terms of black boxes that I've seen, I, it, it scares me the least. Yeah. OK, uh, let's thank Kathy again.